secrets. That's a beautiful song, folks. Amen. All right, it's good to be here this morning. We study the Word of God. When you have God's Word in your hand, folks, you've got the wisdom of the ages. Amen. Amen. Scripture says of, the, of those outside, they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Father, in thy name we pray. Give me wisdom, Lord, in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, turn to Re uh, Revelation. Book of Acts. Get it right here in a minute. Turn anywhere. It's all good. Amen. amen. But if you want to if, if you want to follow me, let's start with Acts 13 this morning. Amen. Acts chapter 13. Okay, now what I'm doing today is to take a topic. We got into it last week. And the topic here is missionary journeys. Now, I'm a missionary Baptist. I believe in, I'm not a hard shell Baptist. I'm not a, you know, the old Calvinist type. A lot of good people there, no doubt about that. But I'm a missionary Baptist. I believe that uh, we have a commission to get the Word of God out. And uh, in the book of Acts chapter 13, you see, the, you see the active intervention of God into, mission, into missions. Note carefully, verse 1. There were in the church that was at Antioch. Notice carefully where it is. Not Jerusalem, but Antioch. This is Antioch of Syria. And you can trace the text that your Bible is translated from. It's called the Syrian type text, and it is the majority text that is based from that location. It was in Antioch of Syria that the Christians, believers, were first called Christians. So the bottom line is that Antioch of Syria becomes a very solid, uh, a solid Christian church, solid believers that uh, grow in the faith and grow in the Lord. And uh, you would think that it would be Jerusalem, wouldn't you? But the problem with Jerusalem is that there were so many Judaizers in Jerusalem. Judaizers were the, were the Jews that got saved. They were truly saved. But they tried, what they essentially tried to do was to cause the church to become just an extension of Judaism. And it's not. The church is the body of Christ, made up of Jew and Gentile. And in Christ, they lose the identity of Jew or Gentile. They don't have that identity anymore. Someone has come along and said, well, I'm a, I'm a Jewish Christian. Well, that's fine as far as you see it is concerned, but that means nothing to God. In Christ, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Greek. The identity's gone. So Antioch of Syria becomes the foundational uh, place for the missionary activity to take place. Once the church is fired up, once the church is where it ought to be with God, they begin to send out missionaries. And notice how the Lord was directly involved in it. This is very important. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, now note carefully, the Holy Ghost said, you'll find Agabus later on in the book of Acts saying this, thus saith the Holy Ghost. Now that's a strange thing. You know, thus saith the Lord is the, is the formula throughout the Old Testament. But in the book of Acts, it is, thus saith the Holy Ghost. Now, why would he do that? The reason for that is because the Holy Ghost, you know, the word is hagias, hagias, pneuma hagias. Uh, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit. But in context, ghost means the coming of Christ in the, in the form of the Holy Spirit to indwell the believer and form Christ in you. That's why Holy Ghost is so important because it is literally the Lord Jesus Christ directly directing His body of believers, His church, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. There are those who say there is no difference between Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. But there is now. There is because of the context, the way it's placed in Scripture. They're the same. They're the same. But when the emphasis is upon ghost and say, well, where did that come from? Well, the, it's the same Greek word translated spirit in one place and ghost in the other. So where do you think it came from? Think about it in a minute. You've got a Bible translated from Greek text. Here you have the translators. They have a Greek text in front of them. They, they have uh, a Greek text in front of them, and that Greek text is pneuma hagias, or hagias pneuma, okay? Pneuma spirit, hagias is holy. And they say, well, let's see. Now, we translated that Holy Spirit last time, but in the context here, 
Holy Ghost. They prayed over it. They prayed over it. Fifty different men in fifty different locations did the translating, came together, compared their notes, and came up with this. That's quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? All right, now look carefully. They said, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted, prayed, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed to Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now, we're not going to follow and trace the specific routes, but what we want to do is to get an overview of what's going on. If you'll remember last Sunday morning, we talked about how that the apostle had a vision. And in that vision, he had intended to go east to carry the word of God, which would have carried him into India, China, Japan, or the eastern uh, Mongolia to go north into the eastern part of the world. But instead, the, the vision, a man in a vision said, come over and help us. And where he was crying for them to help was in Macedonia. Remember? All right. And Macedonia was uh, ruled by Philip. And his son Alexander became who, who's commonly known as Alexander the Great. And if you remember last week, I told you how that Alexander the Great, of course, these are Greek-speaking people. When he conquered the, at that time, known world, he spread the Greek language. And by spreading the Greek language, uh, 2,000 years ago, when this New Testament was written, it was written in Koine Greek, which is common Greek, the common language of the people, not the Greek of Aristotle, Plato, uh, Maximander, and, and so forth. But it's the Greek of the people, they, 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 the, Greek of, uh, the, the Greek of common language, Koine. And so therefore, it was written in a language that was readily available to spread the gospel to the ends of the known earth. Now, that's quite a remarkable coincidence, don't you think? Of course you know. There is no coincidence with God. You know that this was already predetermined, pre-planned, even before the foundation of the world. So Greek becomes the language of commerce. Even the Romans, who spoke Latin, spoke Greek. Even the Apostle Paul, who spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, spoke Greek. And, uh, and, and I'm sure Latin too, because he was a Roman citizen. He probably spoke at least four languages, maybe even more. But he would, I'm sure he spoke Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. So the apostle, uh, uh, so, so he wrote the New Testament, he did, and the other writers wrote the New Testament in what was called Koine Greek. All right, now what was the purpose here? The point is this. The point is that God established a language so that when it came time for the missionary work of the Word of God, the language was right there for them to use to preach it to these different nations. It'd be quite a chore, folks, for me to go over into, uh, for example, Iran and try to speak Parse. They don't speak Arabic in Iran. They're not Arabs. They are Persians. And folks, I don't know, I don't know, I, I, I know nothing about the Persian language. A little bit about their history, yes, but nothing about their language. I couldn't communicate with these people. If you're going to be a missionary and you're going to go off and preach the gospel, how are you going to do it if you can't communicate in their language? You don't have an interpreter. They're going to look at you like you're crazy, right? Either you have an interpreter or you know their language. Now, when we had Brother, uh, uh, what was he with us the other night from uh, Mexico? Drew, Brother Drew. That old boy right there, folks, is fluent in Spanish. I mean, he's been down there for decades, and he, he can speak that language. He speaks it very well. He's so good at Spanish. I asked him the other day out in the foyer. I said, how about Portuguese? I said, can you? Because Portuguese and Spanish are akin, but they're not the same language. And uh, I said, uh, can you understand Portuguese? He said, I can if they'll slow down. He said, I can, I can get about 80% of it. And that's about right, because about 80, 70 to 80% of the Portuguese and, and Spanish language, the words are identical. But about 20%, they have different words with different meanings. But the difference in the two languages is the way they're spoken. Portuguese is spoken like French, the emphasis and the accent, whereas Spanish is spoken like Italian with the emphasis and the accent. And you know that French, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish all came from which language? Came from Latin, the mother tongue. So missionary effort, when it goes out, they go out to carry the Word of God. They go out to preach it to the ends of the world. And God had already laid the foundation for them to be able to carry His Word 
out and preach to the people. And he preached to the people in a common language, Koine Greek, common language, common Greek, where they could understand him. Now, I want you to notice the direction that they went when they carried the word out. It started in Antioch of Syria. Which way did they go from Antioch of Syria? They went west, northwest. They carried it to the west. Now, this is important because, therefore, the movement of history begins in the east and moves west. And when you reverse the course, you start getting into trouble. Have you noticed that every aberration, uh, most of the garbage that hits America, where does it start? Where now? Now, let's think about it. In America, where does it start? It starts in California, and it moves east. All right? It goes from west to east. Now, you take the tabernacle laid out. God said lay it out according to this. They didn't just go to anywhere and pitch the tent. They went to where the Holy Spirit in that ball of fire, that, that, that pillar of fire, stopped and hovered. And wherever the Holy Ghost hovered, the glory of God, that's where they pitched the tent. And that's exactly what a tabernacle is. It's a tent. But it was laid out in a certain order. Each one of the 12 tribes, the children of Israel, pitched about that tabernacle. They all pitched in four separate main groups and then the subgroups within the main groups. Do you know which direction the tabernacle was? If you entered into the tabernacle, which direction would that tabernacle be facing from where you entered? It would be facing east. It was always east. And therefore, as you approached the throne or the Holy of Holies, you were going west. Therefore, the movement and the approach to God was from the east to the west. And the Lord said, as the lightning shineth in the east and you see it in the west, so shall it be the coming Son of Man. Now, you're on a ball. This is a globe. All right, it's a ball. All right. Now, if you go as far east as you can possibly go on this ball... And I'm not exactly where, sure where the line is, but I know if you're in China, you're in the east. If you're in Japan, you're in the east. All right. Which direction would you go to get to the west? All you have to do is continue east, and you'll be in the west. Did that thoroughly confuse you? That mess you up. You continue going east, and you get in the west. You know why? Because it's a ball. It's a globe. That is a completely arbitrary Notation that the East starts in China. In other words, somebody did that. Somebody marked that. Somebody said, this is East. This is West. This is where it starts. This is where it ends. All right? So to this day, if you go to India, if you go to China, if you go to Japan, if you go to Vietnam, if you go to these Eastern countries, you do not go to Christian nations, quote, unquote. What you go to is Buddhism, and Confucianism and uh, the, the, the Shinto in Japan, that's their own religion, that's, it's ancestor worship. And you go off into Brahmism and you go into uh, the, the religions of uh, Persia, which would be uh, Zoroastrianism. You go off into all kinds of pagan religions, all right? And you'll find Christianity here and there mixed in with it, but for the most part, it's not that. So where do you find the gospel of Christ, east or west? West. It's west. And it moved west. Now, here's what happened 600 A.D. You've all heard of Muhammad. You heard from him in 911. You heard from Muhammad. He's been gone a long time, but you heard from him when they bombed those World Trade Towers. You heard from Islam. The word Islam means to submit. Muhammad is the founder of Islam. If you're a Muslim, you are one who has submitted. The word Muslim means one who has submitted. The Koran is the basic book of Islam. But if you get higher up in the hierarchy and become one who, who, trans, who, who, who translates or teaches, then you deal with the Hadith. And the Hadith is the personal uh, teachings of Muhammad as he interpreted the Koran. It's kind of like the Babylonian Talmud. Babylonian Talmud is the Talmud, but the Gemara is the interpretation of the Talmud. You see what I'm saying? You have the book, then you have a book that interprets the book. And so you have the Bible, so what book do I need to interpret the Bible? Don't need one, do I? Do you know who I need to interpret the Bible? Holy Ghost. Exactly, the Holy Spirit. All right. So it went 
east to west. The movement of history and the movement of faith went from the east to the west. Now the area around Israel and uh, Syria and Lebanon and that area around in there, what's it called? It's not east or it's not west. What's it called? It's called the Middle East. Exactly. It's the Mideast or the Middle East. All right. You can go to that area in the Middle East and you can go to where our troops have been fighting now for, for years. And there's two rivers over there, two rivers in that area where they've been fighting in modern day Iraq. Iraq is something that was carved up about, oh, about 19, uh, 19 right after World War I. Uh, they carved up these, the British Empire carved up a lot of these, uh, these nations over there. That, but uh, before it was Iraq, okay, it was an ancient country. And in the Bible it's called Mesopotamia. And the word Mesopotamia literally means the land between the rivers. So it means that at that time it was a point on earth that everybody knew exactly what you were talking about. Those who knew anything knew this that this was the land between the rivers. And the two rivers were the Tigris and Euphrates. Now, do they show up in the Bible? They certainly do. They show up in the book of Genesis. Along with the, along with the Gihon and the, uh, what's the other, Hittichel. All right. You have, you have this land, therefore, that is, the, is called the land between the rivers. Where did Abraham come from when God called him? He came out of Ur of the Chaldees, all right? And where is Ur of the Chaldees located? If you take a map, you can find it today. It's in Mesopotamia. So he was called out of the land of between the rivers. He was called out of that land. Now, that land, when Abraham was called out of it, was a, was an, was, was a pagan land, all right? Which direction did Abraham go? He went west. He went west. He was called out of there, and he went west. So the Word of God... When God revealed himself to Abraham. Now, folks, all over the face of this earth, not a soul knew God the way he should have known him. All right? Now, Paul said in the book of Acts to the elders at, uh, at, at Athens, Greece, he says, there was a time of this ignorance that God winked at. Well, he's talking about that time. They were ignorant. When God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, how much of the Bible did they have? The only book in the Bible that could possibly have been written was the book of Job. Because Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and he wrote that 1400 B.C. So when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, he called him. He revealed himself to him. He personally manifested his person to a man who was living in, 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 in paganism. Not by his own choice. He was born into it. You see, but God chose to reveal himself to him. So it was from Abraham that God manifested himself, called him from Ur of the Chaldees, from Mesopotamia, Took him out of there. He went north to Haran, stayed there until some of his family died, and his father and the rest of them. Then he came on down south into the land. All right. Here is God manifesting himself, revealing himself to one man. From that one man, from the revelation to that one man, we have the Bible, we have the Old and the New Testament, and we have the truth as to who God is. I don't go to the Brahmin. I don't go to the Zoroastrian. I don't go to the Shinto, I don't go to the Buddhist, I don't go to anybody's religion on the face of this earth to get the truth of who God is. I go to Abraham, then I go to Isaac, then I go to Jacob, because that's the formula. Because Abraham had two sons. He had Isaac, and who's the other one? And Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. And this is where Mohammed went. He went to Ishmael, he went to the father of the Arabs, he went to him, he started his line from Ishmael. If you go to the Koran and study the Koran, you'll find that the revelation of truth is not through Isaac, but it's through Ishmael. Are you following me on all this? The revelation of truth. Who is God? Who's the, what's the truth about God? See, And so when Mohammed in 600 A.D. wrote his Koran, he went to Ishmael and traced the truth, the revelation, the, 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 the progression of truth through Ishmael. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, is included in there as a prophet. See, he's a prophet. He's one of the prophets, many of the prophets. And Muhammad is the last prophet. See, that's what he, he's, he's called, the last of the prophets. He's the last, and I'm talking about what they believe, not what I believe. Don't, don't look at me like I'm, you've got to follow what I'm saying here, okay? 
He is the last of the prophets in the Quran. All right? And the Lord Jesus is a prophet, but he is not the Son of God. Because as far as Ishmael is concerned, or I mean as far as Muhammad is concerned, God has no son. Allah, the term for God, means that there is one God. All right? He got that right. And that he, he, got, the, he got it right. And, and, and when he broke the Arab from, pagan, from, from not paganism, but from polytheism, from many gods, he got that right. There is one God. But you see, the problem is, he doesn't understand the essence of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. He didn't get that right. He didn't get that right. And to this day, the biggest falling out that a Muslim has with you as a Christian is over the issue that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He'll agree with you all day that he's a prophet. But when you say he's the Son of God, that makes him equal with God. And he'll fall out with you over that. He will not agree with you on that. Now, that's an issue. That's a theological issue. That is a point of contention. You know, that's an issue. We've got to settle this problem here somewhere. And if you do not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, equal with the Father, and him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, this is the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. Revelation 118, I am the Almighty, he said. All right? If you don't believe that, then you might make a good Muslim. But you're certainly no believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now you see the problem. You see the problem. This problem's been around since 600 A.D. All right, see the problem. We can only walk together so far. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And the thing that makes us who we are, gives us our identity, what we are about, is about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not about the Baptist religion. We're not about the Methodist religion. We're not about the Catholic Church. We're not about Episcopalian. We're not about that. We are about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is preeminent. He is supreme. He is second to none. He is the Lord God Almighty. And without Him there is nothing. He's the Creator and Master and Lord of the universe. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. All right. And when somebody can subscribe to that and can agree with that, then we're all right. We're okay, you know. And, but the Muslim did not. So the progression of history and faith had a conflict in 600 A.D. When Muhammad wrote the Koran, he immediately began to convert. If you think that we send missionaries out, you haven't seen a missionary till you see Muslim missionaries. They go out with a sword. They grab you by the neck. <laughs> Either you submit, which makes you a Muslim, or we're done with you. That is in the Koran. That's how they do it. All right? I don't care what you hear from Washington. I don't care what your politicians told you. It doesn't make any difference what, uh, what the news media spends. Just go to the book they believe. All right. So anyway, the war started, and just within a few years, as a matter of fact, within just a little over a hundred years, which in the span of time is nothing, they had conquered. They had conquered the Middle East. They had conquered North Africa. They had conquered all the way up as far as they could reach at that time. Had even gone up in across the Straits of Gibraltar into Europe. They had moved into Spain, and they had begun to move north, and the Battle of Tours stopped the flow of Islam into Europe. And it was fought, the Battle of Tours was fought, led by Charles Martel, who was the hammerer, and he stopped them. And so they settled into Spain, and they are called Moors, M-O-O-R-S, in Spain. In Spain some has some has some beautiful places. And the truth of the matter is, some of the architecture of the Moors is beautiful. There is a city in Spain called Granada. And in Granada there is a castle that has within built within its complex a uh, a harem or harem. And it's called Alhambra, and it means the red one. And it was there that, and to this, still there now. If you want to go to, if you want to go to Granada, Spain, it's there. In the late 1800s, uh, Spaniard, a Spaniard wrote classical Spanish guitar, and it was Alhambra. 
And it was such a beautiful piece that to this very day they still play it everywhere. It's, I mean, you may have never heard of it or not, but it's, it's a beautiful piece, Alhambra. The, the Arabs are the ones who, uh, have dis have, who have given to humanity and civilization a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge. No question about it. They're not fools, folks. These are not stupid people. Every time you sit down and you put a number on a paper, that's an Arabic number. Okay? And so they stayed there until in 1492 they were driven out of Spain. The same year that Columbus from uh, Isabella and uh, whoever, Ferdinand, whoever it was, the Portuguese sent him over to, uh, to the Americas. All right? They were driven out. They stayed there until 1492. They were there a long time. The harem, still there. You remember that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines? 700 wives, 300 concubines? When you get to the New Testament, you see the fulfillment and the wisdom of progressive revelation from God. For he said the bishop must be the husband of what? One wife. In Matthew chapter number 19, when the Lord Jesus Christ talked to the people of his day, he said it was not so from the beginning. Male and female created he them. One man, one woman. Regardless of what the biology textbook at Farragut says, he made one man, one woman. All right. That was God's initial, that's the way, way he started it. All right. Look how it got perverted. Now, what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that the progression of wisdom, the progression of revelation of God, the progression of truth moves from the east to the west. All right. There is a source of truth. You have to go to the fountainhead of knowledge. You must go to the fountainhead of truth. It does not originate here. It originates there. It originates in this book and in the revelation of the Holy Ghost through the Word of God. Okay? The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That's a progressive revelation. That's something nobody knew until Paul wrote it in 2 Corinthians 5. When God saved the Apostle Paul, he took him off into the deserts of Arabia. He took him into the deserts of Arabia, and there he stayed for years. There he received visions and revelation directly from Almighty God. When the Apostle came back and began to preach to the church, he had to deal with a church that had to shake off Judaism. He had to shake off Judaizers. He had, they had to shake off thinking that they had to keep the law to be saved. They had to shake off the church polity that they were establishing. They had to shake off all kinds of traditions and junk that was hanging on them. They had to shake it off. The Apostle Paul, more than one time in the New Testament, you can see his anger rise up as he deals with the church and how that they are perverting and distorting the truth of the gospel. In the book of Galatians, he said, Who hath bewitched you? Who hath bewitched you that you should depart from the truth that you received? Did you not receive the truth by the Spirit? Were you not justified by the Spirit? How is it then that you try to justify yourself in the flesh? All right. Where does this come from? It comes from the East. It comes from the Apostle Paul. All right. Look at the way the church today has created this big, huge, hierarchical, ecclesiastical system of bishops, presbyters, popes, uh, cardinals, uh, the, uh, this, the Baptist church, the way they do things. You look at all this and you say to yourself, where did they get away from the truth of the beginning? Where it all started? Amen? All right. The truth moves from east to west. Look at the tabernacle the way it was set out in the wilderness. The tabernacle is, is focused, is pointed toward the east. All right? If you approach God, you go in which direction? You go west. You go west. You go from the east to the west. All right? You enter into the Holy of Holies. There you come into the very presence of Almighty God Himself. Okay, now, as the children of Israel are encamped about the tabernacle, there is one camp that is right in front of the door of the tabernacle, and there is one tribe that has been elevated above all the rest of the tribes. 
And it's right there at the eastern gate that enters in to the tabernacle itself. Do you know what tribe that is? Pardon? All right. Now, who, 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 what prophet, what prophets, what prophet is right there in front of that tabernacle? No, I mean, what prophet, who, who, who's the prophet that led them out of Egypt and the prophet of all prophets in the Old Testament? Moses. Exactly. Moses encamped and lived right in front of that tabernacle. It was Moses who got up and led them into that tabernacle. It was Moses who encamped at the door of that tabernacle. In plain words, there was no entrance to that tabernacle without first going by Moses. Now, of course, anybody, just anybody couldn't go into the tabernacle, for that matter, into the holy place because you had to be a priest to do that. All right. If you go around the tabernacle, you will find that the tabernacle is laid out in a specific order. And you'll see that as the movement of the sun goes, just exactly the same way as the people are laid out around the tabernacle, the sun rises in the east and it settles where? In the west. The sun is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why men have been worshiping the sun ever since they've been on this earth. It's a type of Christ. Rises in the east, settles in the west. There is a, an object up there in the sky that you see at night. Sometimes you can see it in the day that reflects the light of the sun. And what is that? It's the moon. It's not the source of life. It, a light, it reflects it, but the sun is. All right. That sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. It rises here and sets there. It reaches its zenith or its, uh, or its, uh, uh, its height uh, every day. It rises to that point. Then it sets from that point. It says of your life, the path of the just, the Christian, is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The perfect day means as high as the sun gets. See? But it never goes down. The Christian life, from the moment that God saved you, will go higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher until it reaches its zenith, to its highest point. What they say after that is called PM, post-meridian. In other words, you have passed that highest point. Now you start going down. That's not in the Christian life. There is no going down. There is no sunset. I don't care how long you've been saved. You've been saved 75 years. You're still climbing until God takes you from this earth. It never sets. And that's a good thing about being saved. Amen. In my spirit and in my soul, I'm about six weeks old. My body is wearing out, yes. But friends, I'm not an old man in my soul and in my spirit. Fact is, I think I get younger by the day. More excited, more interesting about learning, ob observing things. As the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You see, it is the pagan. It is the unsaved who goes down with his earth. He, come, he rises from the dust and goes back to the dust. His life reaches a point where they call it, you know, he's in, the, he's, in, he's in the fullness of life or he's in the prime of life. You hear that all the time. Then his life gradually fades away. Even Solomon, notice, notice the difference between Old Testament revelation and the New Testament revelation. Even Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, talks about the window, the eye getting faded, the teeth wearing out, talks about the hearing fading. In plain words, his description and all these metaphors he used are in reference to the body, literally just wearing out and wearing down. Okay? But I'm not the body. I'm not the body. I'm in a body. And I'm looking to the east for the coming of the Son of Man. And probably every, I don't know how many grave funerals I've had. I, I, my life depends on it, couldn't tell you. But practically every situation, when we go to the graveyard, the, you know, the, the, the funeral director will always say, he, the, he'll say, the head is up there. That's what he'll say to me. Well, that's where I go. I go to the head, the head of the casket, the head, not the feet. And the head is positioned to where it faces east. It faces east. Now, if you go to Jerusalem, you'll find 
Jewish graves all around Jerusalem. Okay? These Jewish graves there, it's easy to see because the graves are facing the Temple Mount. When the Jew comes up, the Bible says that the 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 Messiah or the King or the Savior you see you seek will suddenly come to his temple. They look for him to come to that temple mount. They face the temple. The temple is the heart and soul of, of, of a Jew and his faith. That's why they stand at the western wall and they, and, they, and they cry and they pray. They pray for the coming of the Messiah, the Mashiach, to restore Israel and to rebuild the temple. So they face there. Now, the Muslims, true to their character, at the eastern gate of Jerusalem, the eastern gate. Notice he comes from the east, goes to the west. There's an eastern gate. The eastern gate in Jerusalem sits here and the old temple set there. And the Lord's going to come to the temple. He will come. He'll build the temple. All right? He'll build his own. But there will be a tribulation temple that be, that's built by the Jews. All right? The Muslim comes in there and he fills that land that area in front of the eastern gate full of Muslim graves right there all you got to do is go over there and look they're there and that to them is hallowed ground then they seal up the eastern gate close it off so nobody can get through it and so what they've done is say to the Christian you know you think your Messiah is going to come back and he's going to come through the eastern gate and he's going to come to the temple well we're going to see to it that he doesn't and then, at the very spot where Solomon's temple sat on top of that temple mount, Solomon's temple, then later Herod's temple, Zerubbabel after Sol Solomon's Zerubbabel, then Herod, that temple mount, well, the temple was torn down in 70 A.D. And so what they did in 600 A.D., when, Mo when Mohammed started the Muslim religion, they came in there and they built what's called the, the, the Dome of the Rock. That's a beautiful thing. I've been inside it. I've been all the way down in the bottom of it. And there's a huge rock in there. That's why it's called the Dome of the Rock. It's a huge rock in the bottom of this dome. And the Muslim teaches that Muhammad ascended to heaven on a horse from that very spot off of that rock. And then on the other hand, when you read the Bible, you know that the top of that mountain, that mountain is Moriah. And that's where Abraham took his son Isaac and offered him as a sacrifice to God. That's a very special place. has been for a long time. And I can't tell you, nobody can tell you one way or the other, whether or not that rock was the rock that Abraham took Isaac to. I don't know. But I know that since they have a dome built over the top of it, that that rock's been there obviously a long time. Because you see, when they obviously when they built that temple, they built it over the top of that rock. And it's been there, it's been there since, uh, since, since the time that Solomon built the temple. All right? But the point is they're getting a message over. What's the message? When they, you'll find this all over the Middle East. When they, when they take a church like in, the, in Istanbul, Turkey, it's called Hagia Sophia. Okay? The church of, of Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom. That is not a church anymore. You know what it is? It's a mosque. What's the message? When they take a, when they take a church and turn it into a mosque, defeating, defeating Christianity, that's it. That's the point right there. When they built the Dome of the Rock right on top of where Solomon's temple stood, Judaism, either Judaism or Christianity, whichever one, it shows that Islam is superior. That's the message they're getting over to us. All right. Now, who's going to change that? Do you think, uh, do you think our president would uh, do anything about changing that? <laughs> uh, you suppose the European Union would? All right. What about the Arabs? They certainly wouldn't. What about the Jews? The Jews won't even go up on top of the Temple Mount. They, if they ever do, they raise a stink like you wouldn't believe. Gershom Solomon did not too long ago. He has a group over there in Israel called the Temple Mount Faithful. He went up there on top of the Temple Mount. And man, they had a dog fight over it. So who's going to do away with that? 
of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right. Now, this subject was the movement of missionary activity and the movement of the truth is from east to west. All right. Where did it stop? There's a stopping point for the movement of the truth from east to west. It started somewhere and it stopped somewhere. No, it started and it stopped. Uh, let's just take geography for a moment. What would be the westernmost point on that globe as far as the movement of the gospel is concerned? California. You got that right. The United States fits into this thing in a very peculiar way. It stopped in California. You have tentacles of it that reaches down into Hawaii. You've got Christians in Hawaii, out in the Pacific. You've got Christians in Japan. You've got Christians here and there. But as far as being, as being the faith of the majority of the people, no. It stopped in California. You go any further than California. So where does that put the United States? At the end. Exactly. It puts the United States at the end. That's as far as it went. And so where did it start? It started in Mesopotamia, and it stopped in California. That's the basic movement of the faith of Christ. I'm not saying that there aren't believers everywhere in the world. There are. But I'm talking about at one time, California, you know who, who, who established it? You know, in this nation had two republics. Had two. They were, that's an independent nation, folks. We're a republic. The Republic, the United States of the... We, this is a republic. That means it's governed by law that has a president, all right? Well, we've had two republics in this that at one time were sovereign nations of their own with their own president. And the, and the first president of one of the republics was a Tennessean. One republic was Texas. And they'll let you know real fast there used to be a republic. And I think some of them down there in Texas wish they still were. And the truth of the matter is, I wouldn't fight with them about it. <laughs> and the other one was California. They're both, they used to be republics. Sam Houston was the first president of the Republic of Texas, and Sam Houston was a Tennessean. All right? He's the one who defeated, uh, 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 what's his name down there, in the Battle of San Jacinto. Uh, Ham, ha, Anna, what's his name? Santa Anna. Okay. All right. Now, they were republics, okay? But where did they come from? Who owned the vast majority of that land out there at West at one time? Mexico. That's why it's called Atslan now, because there's a movement afoot right now to turn that country, all that area back in there and give it back to Mexico. All right. How many of you heard about the latest stink about Cinco de Mayo? You, you really don't know what happened about Cinco de Mayo, this latest one? Do you know what happened about Cinco de Mayo? What happened about Cinco de Mayo? Okay, uh, the Cinco de Mayo goes back to 1862 and the Battle of Puebla. And this is when the French had, been, had, had come into Mexico and had tried to establish a European power right next door to the United States of America. The Monroe Doctrine, James Monroe, I forget which president he was, the Monroe Doctrine, that president had this passed by law, there would be no European powers in North America. None. Why did he do that? He did that because he didn't want them breathing down your neck. Okay. So in 1862, Napoleon III sent, uh, sent uh, French troops into Mexico and literally created an empire. He created a foreign uh, he set up a puppet government, and then eventually he had Maximilian, Maximilian became the president or became the, the, the emperor of, uh, of French rule in Mexico. So in 1862, May the 5th, the Mexicans under uh, Benito Juarez defeated the French troops at Puebla. Five years later, the French were completely driven out of Mexico by the help of the United States, by the way, who gave, them, who gave the Mexicans... Uh, armor and so forth, they were finally driven out. So that's what Cinco de Mayo is about. Cinco de Mayo. 1812 is when they declared their independence from Spain. All right. 
Now, what's going on? Now, think of it for a minute. What's going on? What are they trying to do? It's quiet in here. What do you think's going on right now? Well, I mean past the holiday. I mean, a hol- the, the reason for the big holiday, the holiday in the United States, so they can sell beer. They make money at it. These, these businessmen, if they can see a dollar bill in something, they'll promote it like you wouldn't believe. Okay, they don't, care, they don't even know anything about Cinco de Mayo. It's money, dollar bill. That's all they're concerned about. They are trying to, and, and here's what's happening now. You've got a nation full of illegal aliens, millions of them, tens of millions of them, and I never blamed any man who wants to come up here and make money for his family. You know, folks, I feel sorry for these people. I really do. But the whole face of the gospel is changing. Remember, the movement of the truth is from east to west. There has been a dogfight for the last 2,000 years for territory, for land, for the truth, to get the truth out. Just like this Jim Drew said the other night when he was here. He's been in Mexico now for decades. He knows how it works down there. A lot of those Mexican people down there that are Roman Catholics are good people. They're good people. They're good people. They give you the shirt off their back. But they're not saved. They're not born again. Okay? They've never been saved. Never been born again. That's the problem. Okay? That's the problem. And we've run out of time. So next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up just exactly what's going on in the movement of the missionary effort, the movement of the gospel. And uh, what's going on with, these, with, with the illegal aliens and the Illuminati and the elite? And why, why, do, why, do American, why do the elite American businessmen want these Mexicans in this country who are illegals? Why do they want them here? It's cheap labor. They don't have to show them on their card. They don't have to pay... They don't have to. They don't have to pay. Uh, uh, what's that called when you get hurt on the job? Uh, uh, yeah, workman comp and all that. They don't. Have, they don't have. They just give them a paycheck to pay them under the board, and that's it. So what's really going on? What's going on with NAFTA? What's going on with GATT? What's going on with the elite, the Illuminati, and all this stuff? It starts right here in Acts chapter number thirteen with the movement of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Brother Lee, dismiss us, please.